Poland rises up to defend media freedoms. What's going to happen to EU's growing economic powerhouse? Ukraine's biggest bank is up for nationalization. Do we need to worry for country's financial system? Inspiring story of a Ukrainian teenager fighting back against HIV stigma in an empowering way. Before we start, uh, I want to remind you that you can download our audio podcast of all interviews and the show in full on our Mixcloud account. If you go to mixcloud.com at uh, uh, slash Haromatskin, you can find all the recent podcasts there. If you want to watch all interviews in full, catch up with uh, Hromatsky uh, reports and news, you can go to our website and.hromatsky.ua and you can catch up with all interviews and also keep up with recent developments in Eastern Europe by uh, subscribing to a live feed. We'll come back in a second. New spike of political standoff in recent Polish, Polish history, the sharpest escalation between the ruling party and the opposition, it all because of the uh, of the fact of the some media restrictions. There were thousands of people allied against a plan by the conservative ruling party to limit journalist access to the lower house of the Polish parliament. Uh, only five selected Polish TV stations would be allowed to record or broadcast parliamentary sessions and uh, it was decided without the consultations with the media itself, while journalists said that the ruling party violated the constitution by illegally passing the budget for 2017. Police officers early Saturday forcefully broke up an hour-long blockade of the Polish parliament. Police were accused of using the tear gas, which they have denied. Well, some anti-government commentators called the police crackdown as one of the darkest periods in the history of restored Polish democracy. On the other hand, the government supporters uh, say that uh, they actually decry what they call and too intense foreign and EU meddling with inner pol uh, Polish matters. So let's now hear two uh, statements um, uh, from both sides of the fight, starting from one of the Polish opposition leader, one of those, and uh, uh, ending with the country's prime minister who addressed the nation after the police cracked down on the protesters. This parliament sitting, which took place yesterday in the pillared hall, was illegal. If the situation continues, if the parliament speaker, Marek Kosinski, does not recognize this sitting as legal, then we will continue our protest, and the next parliament sitting will start similarly to how the last one has finished, with the occupation of the parliament's podium. The move by the opposition to ignite extreme political emotions, which we observed yesterday, has nothing to do with the actual conditions of the country. On the contrary, it is due to the helplessness, the frustration of those who have lost the power and who have no idea how to convince Poles of their abuse. Despite ongoing political consultation that are happening as we speak in Warsaw between president and all uh, parties involved in the conflict, tensions are still running high and more uh, public rallies are expected in coming days. So because we need to understand what is really happening in Poland at the moment and also to take a look what kind of a European community's role could be in resolving this conflict or helping Polish people to find a uh, consensus inside the country, we reach out to Wojciech uh, Przybylski. Um, uh, uh, he is prominent Polish commentator, and he tried to explain to us what is really happening in Poland at the moment. Take a look. We are very curious to uh, listen to Warsaw, and from there we have a Polish political commentator, Wojciech Przybylski, uh, who is the chairman of the Respublika and, uh, and um, working on a number of the other projects. Wojciech, so we're following closely the protest and the uh, whole political crisis in Poland. But what is interesting now, how will you describe the media situation in general? What was very interesting, there was a viral tweet when it was shown that the public broadcasting of Poland, uh, TVP, uh, had the headline, attempts to destabilize 
is the country while reporting on the protests. So what is the media landscape if we speak about the me big media at this day? What is on the stake? Uh, Polish media are quite diverse and uh, they're strongly anchored in the, uh, in the Polish society. The, there is a number of outlets that is left-leaning, liberal-leaning and uh, right-wing-leaning. Uh, none of them are strictly speaking governmental. And all of them joined the protests against the gag the parliament wanted to uh, have on, on the media, uh, limiting their access to, to the parliament. Uh, on the other hand, the TVP, TVP, it, uh, is, is a governmental media, government controlled, and uh, a member, uh, member of the parliament, Jacek Kurski, is uh, the head of it. It basically is a, a political officer in charge, driving it uh, in a very shameful position, away from a public radio, public TV standard of non-partisan uh, radio, into a sort of a pro-governmental propaganda in a in a bad style. It's it's not it's not done uh, uh, in uh, in a, in a way to convince more people. It is rather being produced, especially when it comes to the news, to um, consolidate support of, the, uh, of the, the existing support of the party. It seems like the situation in Poland is quite likely uh, comparable to other countries in the region or uh, in the developed world, where the media, either pro-government or right or left or any kind of a division, play really important if not decisive role in destroying the middle ground for the uh, for the dialogue in the country and it seems like the crisis in Poland the political crisis in Poland partially is because lack of dialogue be between two sides that usually don't do not even reach out to each other or speak to each other uh, can agree uh, the the main the main the main thing for media the main a rational and the main task for media is to report, to provide news. They might be polarized, but uh, as, uh, as you can see on Friday, the media, uh, which are otherwise uh, competing or even maybe hostile to each other in the, or not really hostile, but ironic, sarcastic, they, they attack uh, each other position, are part of the, uh, of the normal democratic process where where, where there are different sides of the same coin. Uh, you know, we're following for the turbulence in a Polish political life for the last year, but how can you put this particular protest in con into context? You know, how serious they are, because there were a lot of different kind of... How can you explain it for the audience outside? Um, two things happened in parallel. On one side, the media have been excluded from the parliament in unprecedented move, unconsulted move, and even with, you could argue, good intentions from the ruling party to regulate the parliament. Uh, and it is being done in many other parliaments around the world. However, it has been done without consultation of the, with the media society. So um, this is one source of the immediate that trigger uh, of, of, of the problem that started on Friday afternoon. The other one is, at the same time, because of the intense uh, situation, because of several um, bad developments in the in the country, uh, in, in the, I mean, government policy, power execution in the in the last week, uh, there might be a mistake and and and, and try an effort to enforce the political will of the party. The party has majority, and it could have voted easily the budget, but they either got scared or simply disregarded the political process and voted the budget beyond the uh, regulations of the, of the same, of the parliament. And this is the second and more serious root of the problem, because if the, if the ruling party continues to claim that the unlawful uh, voting over the budget has been, in fact, legal, and if the president would accept that, then the, civil, the, the, the ruling party, Kaczynski party, can vote anything and can exclude whatever number of MPs of the opposition uh, without, uh, without, uh, without uh, adhering to the regulations of the same. 
and that opens the door for any change that they were not vote, that they were not elected for, including the changes in the, in the constitution and introducing introducing laws that uh, otherwise uh, they could not be that would not be possible. Wojciech, thanks a lot for clarification, and we'll follow on the issue. It could be one of the most important uh, political and financial story of the months, if not of the season. And we are speaking about possible bailout of the biggest Ukrainian bank called Privat Bank. Um, it started with the uh, change of the regulations of the nationalizations of the banks by the cabinet of ministers in Ukraine. But this is a definitely a bigger story with a lot of parties involved. The bank is partly controlled by one of the richest people in the country. Country, uh, Igor Kolomoisky. Uh, he has a control over some part of the assets, but there is a story with the national bank, with the president, uh, prime minister, and even the IMF. We are here to explain the whole issue and its relevance to the region and explain it, put it into context. But before that, uh, we propose you to hear what the representatives of the bank itself says to press and to the public. The bank is not in crisis. There's no problem in Ukraine. There is a crisis and the economy is in crisis. But in these circumstances, the bank is profitable and modern. For the past two years, there has been talk about the nationalisation of Privat Bank. Our customers have heard this information before and they no longer respond or react. The nationalisation of our bank does not have any impact on our investors or clients because it just means a change in the owner. If the government wanted the bank to undergo nationalisation, it would do so without a lot of fanfare and noise. This is different. The organisers are using the misinformation of nationalisation to create panic. So this will lead to people stopping their payments and to close down the bank. This is why we're not speaking about nationalisation but instead we're speaking about a planned attack on the bank. Well, we want to put a, a bit of per, in perspective what does it mean for the Ukrainian economy and how big is the private, uh, private bank for the whole country. And I want to ask our producer to put um, on the screen uh, infographics. Well, as you can see, approximately 50% of Ukrainians use the Privat Bank payment system in their everyday life, and a third of Ukrainians are depositors or uh, use credit lines at the bank, which says for the country of 45 million, this bank is quite huge and uh, systematically important for the for the whole uh, financial system. Well, apart from the question whether the possible nas nationalization of this bank will affect uh, quite feeble economic growth in the country that is still battling with the Russian invasion in the East and an annexation of Crimea, there are two another important aspects to this story. First of all, the role of IMF, uh, which is related to the, um, to the issue and how far IMF, um, uh, IMF role can go when it comes to bail out, bail bailing out countries and demanding uh, adequate response to the, uh, to the credit line. And the second one is obviously another important example of toxic relations between the state and oligarchy groups, because as we've seen from the statements from um, Privat Bank, they obviously treat it as not as a financial or economic issue, but more of a political one, again, with a uh, um, having in mind that President Poroshenko is related to his own ba banking empire that is the only banking empire that has been expanding uh, in recent years despite uh, economic troubles in the country. And of course, uh, this is the sensitive moment, so uh, it's uh, very... Uh hard for the journalists to work because sometimes there is a freeze for the information. Of course, I think it could be very legitimate as uh, there are concerns not to cause the panic uh, among the uh, people and the clients. But we really would like to explain uh, how big it means to the country and we're happy to have here Timofey Milovanov, who is the deputy chairman of the Council of the National Bank of Ukraine, a Ukrainian economist, uh, and uh, agreed to talk about the particular issues, in particular to explain what it all means and what the relevance to the economy and what we really are 
experiencing and anticipating beside the whole political con context which anyway exists in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let's just clarify that I'm uh, a member of the Council of the National Bank, not of the Board. That means um, our job is to oversee the, uh, the Board and we're not involved in daily operations and anything on the scale of dealing with a particular bank would be a daily operation and so we oversee in principles. So I'm going to comment on the issues from distance, not uh, getting involved into specifics of this specific particular bank. Also I can offer <coughs> some insight or some analysis of what is happening because this bank is a particular, it's a systemic bank and there's a lot of talk about this bank. Um, so. Uh, the, the importance of the bank, of private bank, is it's a large bank. Uh, it's one of the three systemic banks. Um, there is a line in memorandum about systemic uh, memorandum of the IMF uh, about uh, systemic banks. And uh, this is one of the, um, of many other banks which are undergoing stress tests over the last years. And um, um, they have to recapitalize or increase the assets or uh, make sure they're solvent in multiple ways. And different banks uh, deal with this issue in, in, in different ways, and that's natural. And some banks, um, in fact, become bigger. You mentioned uh, Poroshenko's banking empire. I wouldn't call that empire. They're actually a set of international banks which have weathered quite well under the crisis, mostly because their owners uh, recapitalized or mm -hmm. uh, added capital to the banks. And that includes foreign banks, um, city banks, for instance, from the U.S. European banks, as well as banks uh, which with ownership in Russia. Ukrainian banks have difficulty adding capital because uh, the owners of the banks are Ukrainian. Uh, either companies or individuals, and Ukraine is in crisis, so it's natural that for large international corporations or banking systems it would be easier to recapitalize. So it's not very surprising that um, Ukrainian banks uh, have um, somehow diff more difficult time um, getting through the crisis. In addition, their business model often slightly uh, while well, too embedded into the Ukrainian economy, uh, while the foreign banks or some other banks, uh, including Ukrainian banks, take a conservative model. So this means that um, they experience larger losses potentially with their portfolio, and so they, the problems become more acute for them. But don't you f find it a bit uh, disturbing or odd that after this stress test that is, is a, one of the demands of IMF and uh, presumably the government and uh, you know other uh, institutions, financial institutions went through it. The first thing that comes up is a na after this uh, stress test is a na nationalization of the biggest bank in the country, which can send uh, tensions very running very high abroad as a sign that the Ukrainian financial system is in such a bad shape that you know even the, the biggest so, bank is in trouble. So in fact the analysts uh, around the world, the financial analysts, investment analysts are pretty well aware of the situation um, within the banking system and also real sector in Ukraine and this is really not news, the current state of affairs with specific banks including mm -hmm. a specific bank. Of course there is um, um, you know, there is confidentiality of information and, and the very particular details of the situation is not known, but potential risks are even available in public information. Uh, in the recent financial stability report released by the National Bank of Ukraine, if I am not mistaken, last Monday, um, there is information about the banks, which banks passed the stress test and um, which have not, and uh, many of the banks have not, and so the, the approach of the National Bank of Ukraine has historically been to give this bank some room, to some time, uh, to bring their assets and their capital uh, into accordance with some program. So the, the bank, the big bank we are talking about is not the only bank uh, which, are, which are required or expected to add capital mm -hmm. or to clean up their portfolio or do other um, steps uh, to m ensure solvency in the medium and the long run. And different banks respond differently. So this is not news. What might be news is um, whether a specific bank has fulfilled the conditions of adding capital and whether this uh, recapitalization or adding capital has been verified. Um, the governor of the National Bank, uh, Valeria Honterova, about a week or 10 days ago said that the decision to 
uh, approve or not whether the, um, the private bank has fulfilled the conditions of uh, adding capital, so whether the, these conditions will be verified by the end of the year. So it's not very surprising that there is some discussion about uh, um, well, how well the bank has met the conditions mm -hmm. um, of adding capital um, uh, since the market expects that. Um, Timothy, in Ukraine, the politics and the economy goes, and the financial sectors go so close. And, you know, if every second Ukrainian has something to do with this particular bank, of course it creates some kind of a panic mode. And the, there is a feeling of the lack of transparency. And, of course, if there is le less information, the people are confused. And that already can cause the panic. So how do you see these things uh, uh, could be either avoided uh, that, uh, because it really has an impact? And also, what would be the, let's say, a burden and possible um, impact on the Ukrainian economy in the country, which, you know, anyway, depends on the foreign funds and doesn't have really enough of money so, that would be very so, close? So if I can be a little bit more direct. Um, the relationship between politics and big economic uh, corporations or banks is present in other countries as well, including the developed, in the very developed countries. Um, so that's not surprising that we see a little bit of, uh, or we in the media and elsewhere we see some strategic leaking or not so strategic. Uh, leaking of information, we see some posturing through media, we see different press officers making different statements. Um, this is a bargaining game which is um, about, again, the conditions on specific issues. Uh, this is normal. Um, uh, I think this is good news. Um, from a conceptual perspective, because Ukraine has a tendency of postponing resolving the problems. The entire issue with the, all the banks uh, in the financial system is that cleaning up the financial system, making it solvent and stable, is important in order to start up the economy. But the bank, or many banks, can be operational while they are lacking uh, medium to the long-term stability. So while on the surface they could be okay, and there might be even a, a chance that they, everything will be fine in the future, we cannot really put pressure on the banking system until it's clean. It's a little bit like an engine, which is engine is working, but we need to move forward and we need to get on the highway, not uh, drive in the bypass road. And so the, the car seems to be working okay, but we know there could be potential problems. We need to check that car so we can bring it to the highway. And so the fact that this issue is being discussed suggests that the, there is, in fact, a serious effort being undertaken in order to make sure that the financial system is being cleaned up. Now, Ukraine has tendency not to do these things, not to do its homework. And the fact that, you know, if this thing is resolved and we don't see much panic, and I'll comment on panic in a second, and we see that um, it's done professionally, whatever is the solution is, either the bank verifies that it has added capital, great news. I, or the bank doesn't verify that, but then the government takes steps which are natural, makes sense, there's no panic, the, the bank is functional, so on and so forth. There is, you know, five, but ten scenarios. Uh, if uh, this has been done... I think that's good news that, in fact, Ukraine is moving forward. But uh, before we go into yeah. the panic, uh, the, the issue of accountability, and again, putting in perspective, let's just not take in this uh, case uh, just as a separate. We have a long history of Ukrainian government, you know, uh, helping out owners of bank, let's just say that, who would bankroll their uh, bank uh, banks, then put the uh, price check uh, on the Ukrainian taxpayers. And it's a... It's a history, long history of bailing out Ukrainian banks one by another and putting all the issues with paying up debts so, on the Ukrainian taxpayers. So the, the worst case scenario could be when you have an insolvent bank, let's say in 2004, 2008, 2010, and that has been done, in fact, in Ukraine. Um, the banker or the owner comes to the government and says, OK, give me money to bail me out. But I keep the ownership. OK, I'm not going to add my capital. I'm asking taxpayers to add capital, essentially. Maybe under the name of refinance or something else, uh, we will pay you back, but we'll pay you at a very low interest rate, or maybe we will not pay you back, or you know, who knows. Or we will pay you later when the currency will devalue and so mm -hmm. on. And that has been the history. I think what is in fact surprising is that so many banks have been closed that have not been solvent. Because the political process, as you rightly pointed out, 
tends to be, not only in Ukraine, but also in the US in the 80s, that's a classic example where the government didn't want to bail out or did, was too afraid to take hard measures when the credit um, unions uh, went um, mm -hmm. or thrift institutions went insolvent uh, because of high interest rates. Um, you had out, uh, up to 85% of uh, thrift institutions being insolvent and the government didn't take uh, uh, the right actions or strict enough actions until later and then the price stack was 10%. Uh, 10 times higher. So the issue here is that uh, we are actually observing that the Ukrainian government in whatev with whatever, you know, little flaws or large flaws, actually trying for the first time in 25 years to resolve this problem. But what would be, what could be possible, the burden on this kind of thing for the Ukrainian budget in this particular economic situation? Um, so, first of all, when we are saying that something is missing or maybe there is a, we need to add capital, we are talking about the longer term spread. Uh, this is uh, the numbers, we're not talking about the numbers which are immediately will be released in the or the amount of capital which needs to be brought in immediately on any bank. So the bank is a machine which is operational. And um, when we see that something is missing, we are adding capital, that means we are worried that maybe tomorrow or two months from now or two years from now, we won't be able to meet the obligations. And so we need to ensure that there's sufficient capital to meet them. We, again, we are working for the medium and the long run. So in that sense, in the short run, they could immediately, what I mean, tomorrow, today, there could be total, totally sufficient liquidity in the system. In fact, what we know is that in Ukrainian banking system today, we have uh, up to 70, 80 billion uh, Ukrainian hryvnias liquidity. Well, you know, it's, there is structural distortion. Some banks are liquid, others are not, but we have liquidity. At the same time, we have sufficient non-performing loans, about 50% of loans, today are not being performed. That's a paradox. We have liquidity in the bank, so the banks sort of have money. At the same time, th these uh, loans that they issued over time, they're not being performed. Uh, that doesn't mean that they will not be performed tomorrow. They're not being performed. If the economy picks up, those businesses will get their own liquidity. They might be able to pay back. So we need to put capital in place now to ensure that out of those loans, some will yeah. not perform. Well, the problem that the economy hasn't been performing uh, very yes, well. Yes, but and we're again, it's a sort of uh, egg and chicken issue. Until you have a stable financial system, which is prudent, and you don't mm -hmm. have government you know, getting in the pocket of taxpayers every, every moment they have a problem, you can't hope that the banking system will start driving the economy yeah, sure. forward, right? Absolutely. Timothy, so thanks a lot for explaining that. We'll closely watch out in particular this, uh, this issue and that would be probably really the big story and we are looking and we'll be back in a second. These fire violations, uh, that has become the buzz world for a lot of people, means agreement is broken, that things are not working. But what exactly happening today at the Ukrainian front line? How we can put the current situation and explain it to you? Uh, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of people who are living in poor conditions in the, uh, as we call it, the gray zone uh, on the, near the separation line. We have up to two million internally displaced people in Ukraine, and uh, the analysts say, say that the rebuilding war ravaged Donbass may, may cost up to 15 billion US dollars. But uh, that is a part of the story we'd like to explain with the people who somehow from the place know what is happening. Yeah, and bef uh, before we're moving on to the, our uh, next interview, let's just uh, remind uh, um, our viewers about the humanitarian situation along the front line that is uh, still deteriorating. And you're looking at the um, photo from this Saturday. Um, it's up more than 1,000 people lining up uh, at uh, Checkpoint Mayorsky in eastern Ukraine. It was minus 5 uh, Celsius. They were waiting to cross that checkpoint. And put it in perspective, there are just five open checkpoints for more than 3 million people who are trapped into uh, um, on occupied territories in Ukraine. So we decided to talk to um, Major uh, General Kremenetsky, Ukrainian Major General, who is part of the negotiation group in Minsk. Uh, he, sorry, to he, he's a monitor this coordination group. I know it's very complex. Coordination, yes. Uh, so we talked to him, and it's very rare interview for um, such a high-profile Ukrainian um, army official. We talked about the uh, ceasefire violations in the east, the humanitarian situation, and how to put it in perspective in line with the ongoing Minsk um, uh, peace process. Let's take a look. Uh, 
um, Major General, thanks for being with us. And um, you are the head of the Ukrainian side of Joint Coordination and Control Ceasefire Center. So can you explain at this stage, we're hearing different kind of news, reading to the OAC and the other reports, winter 2016. How can we describe the situation with the fire, with the ceasefire and the violation of the ceasefire no. in the front line? I would describe it as uh, stable and under control with some intention to uh, escalation or de-escalation depending on political events, negotiations, Minsk meeting and uh, so on. What it means? Uh, during November, around 300 tons of uh, different ammunitions were shot down on Ukrainian uh, positions and Ukrainian uh, villages and cities where Ukrainian people uh, live. We, uh, we documented a lot of uh, damage to infrastructure as well. So uh, every day we understand that there are going supplies from Russia to through Russia-Ukraine border, which is not under control now. It's around 400 kilometers of non-controlled uh, border. Particularly uh, daily, we have a few Ukrainian soldiers uh, wounded, sometimes killed in action. But the most uh, dangerous fact happened yesterday when uh, one civilian was killed and one civilian was injured during a shooting which happened on the checkpoint, border cross point, on the uh, contact line in uh, Mayorsk, uh, Zaitseva. We have some uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, wounded. There are cases and the Ukrainian side is answering. How would you, what would you say on that? That say, the both sides are to different level, to different extents, but they are violating. Uh, I am not going to say that Ukrainian side is violating. First of all, Ukrainian side uh, uh, doesn't use weapons which prohibited uh, by means agreement, but at the same time, every commander on the contact line can decide how to respond. And uh, the level of response, it should be adequate to the level of attack, especially when it comes to the danger of life of our soldiers, of our citizens, or danger to attack uh, new territories. Um, so what kind of, with what kind of weapon the Ukrainian army in that we, case? We, we uh, in response, we use uh, adequate uh, weapons. Which is probably com 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 very confusing and complex for some of our viewers, but, but still, if you can explain. Mostly we use weapons which are not prohibited by, by Minsk. Uh, so we don't use heavy artillery systems, but uh, we use uh, small arms, light weapons, automatic grenade launchers, this type of weapon. Is there any, like one single day when, within this long term, where we can say that, oh, that day was peaceful? Yes, uh, I, I remember during my two times of deployment in the area, I remember few such days. It was uh, end of August uh, 2015 and beginning of September 2015. And one day this year, 1st of September this year. This day we did not uh, notice any ceasefire violations. So in which areas it's probably the most dangerous for the people to live and which are under the, you know, what are the hot spots? The main hot spots, uh, they are the same during the last uh, two years. First of all, it's uh, Mariupol area, it's uh, Shirokina, Bezimena, this area. Uh, then uh, Avdeevka, Yasinovata, this uh, direction, Marienka, Krasnogorovka, Zaitseva, Mayorsk. Yes. Are there many people living? And, you know, like if they're still there, how? Well, if you take Zaitseva, Mayorsk, close to that area, we have uh, Tretsk, which is around 50,000. And we have, last couple of weeks, we have problem with water supply over there. When water pipe was damaged and water pipe was located in the gray zone, and it took us uh, around a week to receive security guarantees from the Russian side to make some uh, restoration uh, works over there. So it's 50,000 only in Taretsk. But this area, as you may know, densely populated. Of course, many people uh, left the area, but still a lot of people there. 
If we speak about the withdrawal of the heavy weapon and of the weapon, what are the major tasks? Uh, you know, when we, uh, every day we have some uh, shootings with uh, prohibited weapons, it means that these weapons are not uh, withdrawn, at least many of them, and we rely on OEC patrols to verify this. On a daily basis, we provide OEC uh, specific coordinates and specific areas where our intelligence uh, found uh, not withdrawn weapons. Today, politically, there are a lot of people in Ukraine, and not just in Ukraine, who uh, dismiss the idea of the Minsk agreement as something which is not workable, which couldn't be reached. Uh, you're working on the place, and that's somebody who sees what's happening on the ground. What would you say on that, that like the, the chances that it's, it's not working? Well, in my current uh, capacity, I work as a tool of Minsk agreement. So the main task of a joint ceasefire control and coordination center was to implement Minsk agreement. And this was the main task uh, and my job which I was doing. So uh, I am not in position to criticize or be in favor of Minsk agreement. I am not commenting them. I am just uh, trying to implement uh, them. Of course, many people can uh, criticize or can say some, uh, appreciate them, whatever, but we have them and we have to implement. Do you think there is another way to deal with that? Another tool could be used uh, well, at this uh, stage of the conflict? To my mind, any tool we use, then point number one will be ceasefire. Or it means agreement called it uh, whatever, but to solve the conflict, if we look in history, every, every conflict or solution of the conflict should start with ceasefire. I believe that uh, solution of this conflict should be, as we say, uh, com should be comprehensive approach, both uh, diplomatic, uh, political, economical, and then military. There is the Russian general on the place, and um, it works, we reported about that, but what kind of communication is that? Well, uh, indeed, in uh, Solidar, we have a joint center headquarters where we have a Russian general, Ukrainian general, and of course a Russian team and Ukrainian team. We have a situation room where we have 24-7, three Russian and three Ukrainian officers. They try to solve uh, these ceasefire violations. But the main problem is that in joint center, Ukrainian side clearly understands that we are side of conflict. And we believe that Russia is side of conflict as well. But the uh, Russian side never recognize them, that they reject all uh, tokens about that they are side of the conflict. They reject all accusation that they support and supply uh, representatives of uh, Donetsk and Lugansk areas by weapons, mercenaries, ammunition, whatever. So they always reject this. So uh, we tried to find solution to stop ceasefire violations. And we interact uh, particularly in this area without any political discussions. If we go into political discussions, we became very emotional, non-diplomatic as well. But uh, we have clear task to uh, monitor uh, ceasefire violations, to report about this, and to take measures uh, to stop them. What we are doing, and uh, with this purpose, we are talking to the Russian side. And um, at this stage, how we can say, what are the major tasks at this moment? Because, of course, it's a ceasefire, of course, it's withdrawal, uh, but if you meet, for instance, with OSC, with somebody else, there is probably a task for day one, two, three. So uh, of course, crisis management, it's a joint venture. We work very close with uh, SMM OEC when we need to do some restoration or renovation uh, works. Still, there are a lot of unsolved problems which can create humanitarian or ecological uh, What are they, problems. for instance, uh, for, 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 for the recent for example, future? For example, there are still three uh, places where situation not solved from humanitarian or ecological point of view. It's, uh, Bakhmut Agra Bakhmutsky Agrarny Soyuz, which is agricultural factory which produce pork. There are a lot of uh, waste which uh, should be disposed. 
but uh, should, uh, a lot of areas are mined, so it should be uh, mine clearing should be done. For this, we need for our engineers to do demining. We need security guarantees from other side. Unfortunately, during the last few months, we cannot receive these security guarantees. Another area, it's um, one chemical, or phenolny chemical uh, factory in the Novgorodskaya. In this also danger of uh, poisoning of soil and water with some chemicals. And we need to do some restoration uh, works over there. Unfortunately, we still didn't receive security guarantees. Okay. And the third one is gas pipe uh, and gas pumping station in Krasnogorovka, Marienka, that area, because people are now suffering without heating and it's winter time. We still, during the last three months, we cannot receive security guarantees from Russian side and without any explanation. So this is the three main uh, problematic areas from humanitarian point of view. But of course, uh, within area, we have a lot of uh, problems and every day when he, we have damage of some infrastructure, we try to coordinate with Russian side and with OECE. Sometimes Red Cross uh, involved as well, just to uh, provide ceasefire or security guarantees on these particular areas to make some works. Uh, now, we would have soon the Christmas and New Year holidays during these times. I mean, if you remember, you, during these times, do we have the situation calmer? What are the concerns? Because people would travel more. People would like to meet the families. And, you know, this is a still a particular time. Uh, it is very difficult to predict because many activities of other side are absolutely unpredictable. And uh, even when we have agreement to stop fire, Sometimes it doesn't happen. So uh, it's, it will be very difficult for me to predict. But the uh, Ukrainian side will try to talk again and again, at least during Christmas holidays, to give people opportunity to travel to see their relatives. With this, we also uh, maybe improve the work of uh, checkpoints, or border crossing, uh, contact line crossing uh, points, and more people maybe can uh, travel. another invader. The country has one of the highest HIV rates in Europe. And uh, according uh, to UN AIDS experts assessment, about 290,000 people live with HIV AIDS in Ukraine. Well, many Ukrainians still uh, face stigma over their positive status and they are forced to hide um, this, uh, this status from even from their relatives. But the most shocking thing that according to latest numbers, uh, the most of the newly registered cases uh, are amongst young people aged 15 to 30 years old. But uh, our colleagues from Hromatsky had filmed this incredible and very inspiring story about 18-old Dania, the guy who is himself an HIV positive, but he's running an organization helping other teenager to cope with their disease, to cope with the situation. So please watch. I'm a student of Kiev's Medical College No. 1. I'm 18 years old. When I entered the college, I was extremely happy and turned on my doctor mode. I beat HIV psychologically. The most important thing is to change the attitude of people. 123,000 young people are at risk. 123,000 people are in this group. Due to the lack of funding, there is little information about it. And meanwhile, the number of people at risk is increasing. Each hour, 29 people get infected in the world, on average. I mean young people. Teenagizer, we are moving soon. It's good when people have questions. When you're finding out about your status, the worst situation is when a person pretends he or she understands everything, when actually they don't. I know they don't understand anything. You are waiting for them to ask about HIV and to ask questions to prevent any misunderstanding. I was about seven to eight years old, maybe closer to seven. For the whole year, I was on an antiretroviral treatment. My mother was giving me medication and saying it was vitamins to enhance my immunity or that it was for my liver. 
It irritated me so much. Then, after a scandal, we had a talk, and I asked why I was taking the medicine. She told me that I was HIV positive. It made me feel better. For many people, it's stressful when they find out about their status. They feel bad. But in my case, I was relieved. I was taking medicine for a year, and I didn't even know what for. And when I found out about my HIV, I just accepted it. I've never been afraid of it. Only 0.4% of youth and teenagers took a test in Kiev in 2015. That's about 400 teenagers out of 116,000. A lot of people are afraid to do it. It's better not to know, they think. No, it's better to know, because if you find out about HIV in time, it won't harm you. There was a period when I refused the therapy because I felt good. But then I understood that I felt well because it was being treated. You can get medicine for free. The state provides people with it. Let me find it. Here it is. I take it several times a day, in the morning, in the evening and at night. I won't show you the brand. The only restriction is that I can't serve in the army. It's a kind of taboo. And according to Freud's theory, a forbidden wish is the most desired. We have our names for HIV and AIDS. When someone asks me about my HIV, I say it's a pity that I can't shake its hand when greeting it in the morning. AIDS doesn't sleep when you are sleeping. I promised him to come to the Netherlands for New Year, and he asks me whether I'll live to that time. You can ask for a cigarette and say, don't worry, HIV isn't transmitted this way. People who don't know much about me, who are not from my circle of friends or see me for the first time, are shocked. It's like a person in a wheelchair, joking about wheels. I don't know what to say. Have you seen Fight Club? There was a character that said, if I had a cancer tumour, I would call it Marla. I also call my HIV Marla. And we are still just beginning to understand the fallout of Brexit for the European Union with so many details still unclear. But there is little doubt in Ukraine that it's doing nothing good for Ukraine as also for some of the uh, Eastern European countries as uh, they still see EU as the uh, EU project as the role model. So that is something how we feel here. Well, yeah, obviously the, the Brexit it has quite negative uh, mentality impact on the whole region of Central and Eastern Euro European region where people still aspire to join the European Union in some future. And we had a chance to talk to a British Conservative member of the Parliament, John Whittingale, who is a fierce supporter of the Brexit, but at the same time he's a member of the UK-Ukraine um, group. And because that, Romatsky will also ask him uncomfortable questions about his controversial connections to Ukrainian oligarchs. Let's take a watch. I, I have always wanted to see a Europe which was broader, including more countries, but less integrated, less centralized in Brussels. The reason that Britain became steadily more unhappy uh, with our relation with the European Union was that it became more and more a political project. It was integration with more power being given to Brussels. And so we felt that we had less and less control over our own policies. That was particularly in the case of immigration, which was a huge issue in the referendum. But the general position that our laws were being overruled often by Brussels, which was distant from the British people. And so there was a very strong view that we wanted to regain uh, the right of self-government. And are you satisfied with the result? 
I'm very happy with the outcome of the referendum, which is what I campaigned for, which is a very clear mandate to the British government that we will leave the European Union and look for a new arrangement. But we are now entering a period during which we are going to have to work out that new arrangement, and it will take time. Uh, but how it goes together, like some any kind of communica communication with post-Soviet countries, Eastern European countries, where you have the feeling of the isolation of uh, the United Kingdom and people busy with the domestic, not international stuff. Well, you're we don't see how it goes together. <laughs> well, you're right that this is going to be a challenge for the British government, which is going to take time. But that is not to say that we will not still be a very strong voice internationally. One of the reasons why I supported Britain leaving the European Union was because it actually allows Britain to forge stronger relationships with countries beyond the borders of the European Union. At the moment, if you're in the EU, for instance, you're not allowed to reach a bilateral trade agreement with another country. We, we couldn't have a, a trade agreement with America or Canada or China because it has to be done through the EU, even though the EU's record at doing so is terrible. So we now see this as a chance to strengthen our relationship with countries around the world. And I would still argue very strongly that we must be a very powerful voice uh, in such areas as the current uh, challenges in Eastern Europe and post-Soviet countries. And of course, we are still going to be the second biggest contributor to NATO. We're a member of the G7. So there is no question Britain will still be a very strong voice. But what we feel with any communication with London, you talk to diplomats, experts, people in Brussels, people outside of the UK, and some of the very strong voices inside, that today uh, London, uh, Whitehall, Downing Street are busy with the local issues, which means the issues of you know the Ukrainian support to Ukraine, uh, the uh, the kind of the unity over the uh, sanctions against Russia, where the unity of the Western allies of Ukraine is very important. You kind of see that the Brexit pushed this unity away, and there is some kind of issues between London and between the Brussels. So instead, something this region needed, in especially within the context of the uh, annexation of Crimea, of the Kremlin influence, instead of the strong unity of the European Union, you, you, you see that one strong member is just busy and preoccupied with his own domestic things. Well, I don't think that's true. Um, yes, we have an awful lot of work to do to reach a new arrangement with the European Union. I sit on the parliamentary committee now, which oversees that, but that doesn't mean we don't wish to continue to play a strong role in the challenges which face all countries. Now, the fact that our new foreign secretary, after the referendum, chose as one of the very first countries to visit it was Ukraine. And he has also spoken out very strongly, as have other members of the British government, in condemning Russian activity, uh, both against Britain as well as uh, in Ukraine, uh, shows that we remain a very strong supporter of Ukraine and we intend to continue to punch our weight and more in the international arena. One of the reasons for my coming was firstly to reassure people in Ukraine on the questions you have quite rightly asked me about whether or not it means we are not going to be able to take an active role in Ukraine because we're too bound up with our own concerns, and I've made it clear that that is certainly not the case, but also to get across that Brexit in some ways will allow us to reach stronger relations with individual countries where we have historic tries or where we see opportunities, um, and certainly I would like to see a very clear trade agreement with Ukraine, uh, Ukraine but also uh, strengthen political cooperation. You're currently that. not a minister, you're no. a member of parliament. I, but to be honest, I have initiated it. Um, as a member of parliament, um, we actually have a, a little pot of money that's available to MPs uh, in order that we can go and visit capitals of Europe to talk to fellow politicians in those capitals and um, Ukraine comes within that and so I was able to ask Parliament whether they would support my visit today and I'm hoping to come back uh, probably in the new year and bring some of my co colleagues on a follow-up visit. Uh, and in particular whom you would like to meet and like if you have to short-term aim so is it just reassuring that after Brexit? No it's I mean it is a matter of, of reassuring people that the United Kingdom remains a very strong supporter of Ukraine and we're, and we're not going anywhere, even though we may no longer be in the European Union. Um, but I've also always taken an interest in trying to support Ukraine in the 
meeting the challenges of becoming more transparent, more democratic, uh, introducing a stronger independent judiciary, and obviously tackling corruption, which remains a big problem in this country. Um, and I know there are a group of my colleagues who want to do the same. And whilst I've been here only for 48 hours, I've tried to listen to voices from right across the political spectrum. And that's always been my approach, to, you know, to listen to all the different views as to how to take Ukraine forward. Mr. Wittendale, within the last uh, years, of course, the Ukrainian journalists uh, are looking uh, closely to the uh, Ukrainian oligarchs, to what, because that's a part of what you've just mentioned, the mm. fight of the corruption. So always, uh, we know that you, the part of the um, Ukrainian British society, you were uh, active in some, some things. So for instance, and there is a lot of information online. So for instance, the Atlantic Council, yeah, they issued this report, the Kremlin Troy and Horses, and we do have, you name here with your connection to Mr. Firtash, a Ukrainian oligarch. Yeah, it's a kind of a serious thing saying. It's not the defamation it, balloting. It's a very important well, it, paper. Well, it, it, it is very badly researched, if I may say. But because one of, the, well, one of the things I would say is that I have probably been more critical in my public comments about Russian um, invasion and occupation of parts of Ukraine than almost any other British member of parliament. I initiated debates on Ukraine during the Maidan, uh, in the post-Maidan, during the annexation of Crimea, and I've always made my clear my utter condemnation of Russian involvement. Um, and so I have sought to be a voice in favour of Ukraine. Now, I was uh, before I joined the government, supported in a couple of my visits by the British Ukrainian Society, who allowed me, by arranging, for instance, my attendance at the Yalta European Strategy Conference, it was there that I first met uh, Mr. Poroshenko, Mr. Yatsenyuk, uh, Vitaly Klitschko. I probably couldn't have made those trips if uh, I hadn't had that support. I, yeah. At no point did uh, Mr. Firtash ever try and influence my opinion. He, I never, he never paid me money, but the British Ukrainian Society did help me make those trips, and I learned an awful lot about your country as a result. So um, I would like really to clarify, since we have this chance to talk, so it's clearly written that the organization uh, sounds like a bilateral relations grouping, but is a front of the Firtash personal PR, PR effort, and there is a name of Lord Risby, and there is a your name. So what is in particular, if you would, you have this chance to clarify, what no. is your relations with Mr. Firtash? Fir well, How often do you communicate? I um, don't. I mean, I, I, when I, I was supported by the British Ukrainian Society before um, I became a member of the British government. When I became a British member of the British government, I had to give up all my involvement in outside organisations and the, you know, all external interests, quite rightly. That is part of the rules of becoming a minister. So I had, uh, I resigned from any involvement with the British Ukrainian Society, uh, as I did from various other groups, uh, including, sadly for me, the all-party parliamentary group on Ukraine. Um, and... I have had no contact since then. I am now able to resume my interest in Ukraine because I'm no longer a member of the government, but I'm acting independently now. So in that way, for instance, this trip is paid by... As I explained to you, um, this the... trip is paid for by the British Parliament. Well, that's a wrap, folks. That's all we have this week for you uh, at Hromatske and the Sunday show. I do encourage you to go to the Hromatske uh, English website and .hromatske.ua to catch up with full versions of an interview that you've seen uh, during our show and also catch up with other reporting that Hromatske does all around the region of Central Europe and Eastern Europe. And also catch up uh, with the latest news on Hromatske Twitter and Facebook page. My name is Maxim Ristavi. Thanks for having me as your guest co-host this week. And I'll say goodbye as well, warning that we are not really going for the Christmas break. There would be a different format of our program, so please follow and see you soon, probably still in 2016 and in 2017. <laughs>